Thank you so much for coming. Yay. Look at this small but mighty. Oh, Tanya's here. Yay. Um, and that might happen. I'm actually trying to kill a little bit of time to let our lowly, lazy, <laughs> late legislators uh, come in the door. Um, and I say that with love because I am a state senator. My name is Becca White, uh, and I serve Windsor County. Windsor County is a little bit south of here, but you've got some fabulous legislators who actually represent you in the room. So before, I think we've got one more person who's a legislator coming. We're gonna do a quick like, hello, my name is, where you represent, and if you have a committee of note related to climate, or if you have something you wanna say, this is a great time. And look, they're all like in the comfy corner over here. So Phil, hey, can you kick us off? And maybe you can pass the microphone so town meeting TV can All right, uh, Phil Pouch from Heinsburg. Um, I've been a legislator for two years and running again for another one. I'm on the transportation committee. A lot going on there, particularly on climate stuff. And I'm really glad to be there. Tanya Vihovsky, I am a senator. I represent Essex Town, Essex, the city of Essex Junction, Winooski, most of Burlington, and a little bit of Colchester. Um, I'm on Judiciary and Government Operations, and you wouldn't think that had much to do with climate, but the Judiciary Committee passed the Make Big Oil Pay Bill this year. And our Government Operations Committee worked really hard on a flood response bill and climate disaster response bill to really streamline how government responds when we experience the increasing number of climate disasters that we are. Hi folks, um, Kate Logan, uh, Rep Kate Logan. I represent the Chittenden 16 district. Um, we are in it right now. Um, it is, it's uh, central Old North End, downtown Burlington, and a little piece of the Pine Maple neighborhood. Um, I just, I'm just finishing my first term and running for re-election. Um, I serve on the House Committee on Environment and Energy, so everything we're talking about today pretty much ended up coming through my committee at some point. Um, so really excited to be here thanks for joining us tonight and we have an unexpected member joining us today Hi, I'm Leonora Dodge. I'm the rep for Chittenden 23, which is um, the suburban part of Essex Town and a little segment of the uh, city of Essex Junction. And I've been a legislator for two years alongside Phil on transportation. I'm the clerk for the House Transportation Committee and um, really excited about the climate action that uh, we took for last session and very excited to continue plugging along for next session, hopefully. Um, and um, I'm bilingual. I grew up in Montreal, so I'm a really huge proponent of public transit. And I also grew up in Mexico City. So um, that's another major point that I'm going to be trying to uh, encourage this year. We are facing a lot of challenges with our public transit system. So. A lot of good conversations to be had there. My name's Abby Duke. I represent Chittenden 17, which is um, the western Old North End, southern New North End, and the Intervale. It's the largest district in Burlington, but the only single member district. I was appointed in May, so I'm the newest member. They colloquially refer to the seat as number 150 because I was appointed, um, and then I'm running uh, for a full term. Uh, I'm on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee uh, and uh, economic development, th there's a lot of really important um, uh, implications for economic development from our transition to clean energy. Thank you, I'm Sarita Austin. I'm a representative from the Mallets Bay section of Colchester, Colchester uh, 19. This, if I am reelected, this would be my fourth term in the legislature, I'm on the Education Committee, and you can tell what a wonderful session we had last year. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I just want to say that I share Leonora's uh, concerns. We were on a call with uh, the Transit, Mountain Transit, talking about the uh, routes that they're closing. Um, 
and that's very concerning to me. And um, just to how to provide public transportation for Vermonters and still um, lower uh, the admissions are kind of a, another challenge for us. So thanks for all coming out tonight. And I'm sorry I was late. I'm well. We're just doing in terms of names. Yeah. yeah. And the committee and basic. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I think I've got it. So um, I'm sorry I'm late. I, got, I was working at one of my four jobs. I think it's important <laughs> to acknowledge that I have four paid jobs and two unpaid jobs. So um, I'm Brian Chena. I am a state representative from Burlington, Chittenden 15. So it's uh, just around the corner from here, along Riverside Ave, all the way to Winooski, Centennial Woods, UVM. So it's part of the old North End and most of the East District. And I'm, I should keep the mic by my mouth, sorry. Um, I'm on the House Health Care Committee and the House Ethics Panel. And if you saw the news this last year, both committees were, had very interesting things going on. Um, and uh, I've been a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus since I started in the legislature, so it's been eight years. I don't have an opponent, so I expect to get reelected for my um, fifth term. And I'm interested in talking with you all tonight about intersectional solutions for the housing crisis that can not only address climate change, but all of our ecological challenges that are coming ahead. So I'm hoping there'll be a time to talk about some creative ideas uh, about how to center our unhoused people in the solutions. Ooh, okay, thank you all your state reps and senators. So you're welcome to grab a seat or hang on the couch wherever you wanna sit, get comfy, well, no rush. Oh my goodness. Wow. The, the elected official to constituent ratio is very good tonight. <laughs> if, you, if you have a specific topic you want to talk to an elected official about, you might be able to do that. Um, and that's actually a really good sign because it means that you have a whole slate of folks who are concerned about the climate and are concerned about our future. And I'm really proud uh, that we have so many of the Climate Solutions Caucus members in this area. Uh, and it's a great thing to kind of end on because this is the last stop in our legislative Climate Solutions Caucus tour. And I'll, uh, I've got a little surprise for Jordan at the end that maybe I'll get help with. But um, Jordan is actually the person who you should be looking at and applauding at any point during this because she is amazing. <laughs> Uh, and she uh, produced everything. So I just got to like show up and be like, I hope the PowerPoint's connected. Um, and hopefully it is. And hopefully someone or I will turn the, the slide. <laughs> there we go. It's me. I'm in charge of that. Uh, so the Climate Solutions Caucus uh, is what we're really going to focus on tonight and some of the work we did. I'll tell you what the Climate Caucus is, tell you about our recent successes and challenges. And some of your reps and senators have actually highlighted a few of them. So we'll have time to talk about those challenges and big wins. We're going to talk about what our goals are and what we're thinking about for next session. And then we're going to have some group discussion. So you can break out. And if you heard where your representative is or you have a specific senator you want to talk to, you can find them and talk to them after. And we can have kind of that group discussion. We can also do a time for open questions if there's something you want to ask that you think would be beneficial for everyone to hear. OK, so what is the Climate Caucus? Uh, in the Vermont legislature, we have groups called caucuses. A caucus is either a partisan party, like the Democratic Caucus or the Progressive Caucus, uh, or an issues-based caucus. And ours is an issues-based caucus. So we do not have a political party affiliation, meaning we have progressives, we have Democrats, and we have had a Republican or two. Uh, and or and independence. I'll tell you, we get a lot of good independence in there too. But it is the largest uh, caucus in the state house, other than the parties themselves. There are 93 members of the Climate Solutions Caucus, which is pretty cool. Uh, one of the key things that makes that dynamic important for having a caucus is that it creates a House side and Senate side space where we can collaborate on ideas. So in the Vermont State House, there's often a joke that it's not political parties that disagree, but at times it's the two chambers. So the House members and the Senate members don't always have the best relationships. So it's also a space for us to work together and have good communication between, yeah, look, even, I even have House members who like me though, so it's great. Um, 
but they we have we don't have like a space to talk to each other so we end up being in these bubbles where we might be working on a great bill like s213 that i'll tell you about in a bit but we might have a part of that bill that's actually existing in a bill over on the house side and we don't know that because we don't see each other throughout the day it's like different grades in school we don't run into each other as easily so this is like our recess opportunity where we can make eye contact and talk to each other and have pizza usually provided by Jordan uh, and VPIRG, uh, and talk about issues that are facing our collective group of people rather than just our individual committees or chambers. We set caucus priorities every uh, legislative session. Uh, every legislative session um, actually is a, t we have a two year term, so there's bienniums, and we do this every year. That's something we, instead of just doing it for a biennium, we do it every year. So we, chose these priorities through i don't know like a f i would call it like a fun retreat style you know we're all writing stuff on big pieces of paper and then we're synthesizing it and then we kind of land on some stuff um, so that's why we have uh, such a wide range of priorities is it was a collective process to come to it so it's not me as the chair on the senate side setting the priorities it's us as much as possible as a collective so I really appreciate that because you don't always see that in um, other issue-based caucuses. This is Gabrielle Stebbins. She is the House side, and she is not running for re-election, which I know, which is like a, dang it. Um, but uh, I like this photo because uh, it shows the three E's, which is the environment, the economy, and equity. So you've got, that's kind of our, our three E's that we talk about quite a bit. Uh, oh, did I skip one? Oh, no. So if you're here tonight, you're probably familiar with the fact that climate change is the greatest existential threat facing our collective humanity, just to put it lightly. Uh, and not only is it something that we must be proactive about, it's something we're experiencing right now. So it's not a future problem, it's a now issue. Uh, and some of the examples of it being a now issue, uh, you could just see in in being in Vermont the last two summers. If you are ever in Montpelier or in Barrie, uh, you know that the flood that affected us in July 2023, and then again in parts of that area in July 2024, had Hinesburg, I mean, exactly. Exactly, like we're just experiencing tons of these natural disasters at a greater rate and we can see them now. And so there's really no, even folks I know who are like straight up climate deniers, I'm like, but haven't you noticed something different? And they're even like, something's different. Um, and we can attest to that. I wasn't at this Climate Solutions Caucus meeting, but um, in Brattleboro, the theory wasn't that it was global warming, but that it was cloud seeding by the Biden administration. So we are getting to the point where people at least know something's wrong but they may be attributing it to things that are conspiracies as well so we need to make sure we focus and are clear we have science we have data we know what's causing the climate crisis and its carbon emissions and it's affecting us uh, to a really extreme rate oh one thing I do want to highlight that I didn't um, and I will say you've got the best package of legislators to, to have this conversation, but the most vulnerable Vermonters are most greatly affected by global warming. We just know that flat out. The lowest income folks in our community are most likely and are experiencing the impacts, whether that's financial um, or uh, just in their day-to-day -day lives, the emotional toll of the uncertainty that comes along with the experience of climate change. So. Now that I've brought you down a note, um, we did some really good stuff this legislative session because we have such a phenomenal group of people who are working on it every day when we're in the legislature. So coming out of the legislative session, under improving community resilience, we worked on a whole host of things, but these are the three I wanted to highlight. So if there's a legislator who has another bill not on this list, feel free to mention it, but these were kind of the top three. The first is S213, also known as the Flood Safety Act. Uh, and the idea there was to make sure that when we have building and development happening, that we are also taking into account where the potential natural disasters and flooding may happen. Um, that's kind of the core idea behind that. Um, so when you have a downtown 
the goal was that we started to map and look at the river corridors around our state so that if you had a downtown, you could potentially have a wetland above that downtown. So when there's massive flooding, that wetland acts as a sponge or even as a kidney, is what some folks are saying, calling wetlands, um, to uh, divert the greatest impacts of flooding. So there's what, a lot of like common sense development and planning things that we could do to reduce the risk of flood damage. Um, so we did a lot with that. If you want to talk to me about fluvial or inundation flooding, I learned so much about it. Um, and I <laughs> believe anyone in a uh, uh, Natural Resources Committee did too. The second is one that actually Senator Vihovsky noted, which is S310. So not only do we need to change kind of the natural resources and planning side of things to resolve natural, the greatest impacts of natural disasters, but also our government <laughs> needs to be able to respond. Um, and one of the telltale stories that we heard coming out of the flood were examples of, of gaps. Gaps in the system where folks weren't able to get the help they needed, either because communication wasn't readily available to them, or the people who were in charge of helping them weren't sure where to go or what to do. Um, so in those very high risk, right after a disaster or during a disaster, I think we all collectively want to know that we're well funding those, um, those systems. And that was a big part of S310 was looking at how the government responded. And we created something called the Climate Resiliency Grant Program, which injects money directly to municipalities who are the ones experiencing the greatest cost, unfortunately, um, outside of individuals. Then the last, but certainly not the least, was uh, we advanced a thermal energy networks bill. Uh, that's, that's cool for like this area it, and also other downtowns because it's a network of, uh, of thermal heating that allows multiple buildings or multiple residences to benefit off of like one power source or one energy source and have it be distributed throughout. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Denmark and they are crushing it over there with this style of um, energy planning. Uh, and in my town, Hartford, we're looking at having our wastewater treatment center actually be a network to heat our downtown buildings. So using that excess energy and heat to actually power our buildings. And Representative Logan could probably talk more about this bill, but I won't spend too much more time on it. Um, we also modernize the renewable energy standard. This is only like slide two, guys. Like, we did so much. Um, so the res, as it's called, um, was a, at times, controversial bill. Uh, and it went through both uh, the House and the Senate and was vetoed by the governor and then overridden. I believe that's the first of the bills that I will be mentioning that fact to you about. You will hear more on that. Um, a couple of vetoes may have happened around climate issues, of all things. Um, but the legislative working group that uh, happened over the last summer uh, created a blueprint for how we could uh, re, uh, re we could uh, renovate, I don't know, we could improve the renewable energy standard, which is a law we passed in 2017 that sets standards and requirements for our utility companies. So that's, in my area, that's Green Mountain Power. For you, it might be like Burlington Electric Department or also Green Mountain Power <laughs> or a smaller utility company. It set requirements for them to meet certain uh, renewable energy standards. So they have to have a percentage of their generation coming from clean sources or sources in state, there's tiers, it's a little complex, but uh, you should know, bottom line, we are making sure that renewable energy is a part of the portfolio of our electric utilities, and we want to step that up over time. There you go. That's like my, that's my quickest example I think I've ever done of that bill. Uh, and there was a lot of debate, but it, uh, it, and we might do a little tweaking, but it came out a lot better than not doing anything. Uh, and I wanted to highlight this part because all of the concepts that we're talking about, including the renewable energy standard, are built off the fact that our electric rates in our, in our state are extremely stable and are some of the lowest, if not the lowest, in New England. Uh, so that really underscores why you might notice in each of these bills kind of a push towards electrification and away from fossil fuel use. It's not just that we know fossil fuels 
are something we need to wean ourselves off of, it's also more expensive and costly for the average person than switching to high energy efficiency electric alternatives. So just wanted to note that. And you've got Efficiency Vermont, or if you're in BED, you've got, uh, they've got an efficiency utility, and I don't know what the name of it is, but Burlington Electric Department's efficiency utility. So now that I've covered uh, all things renewable, a whole other angle to the climate crisis is land development. And we already had a, uh, Representative Chena brought up a really good point, which is there's an intersection between housing and the climate and also you know, poverty and oppression. But for tonight, I wanna highlight the implications of the climate change overlap with our housing development. Because we spent a lot of time reforming a bill or an act called Act 250. Now, do, who knows what Act 250 is? Or like they've heard about Act 250. Okay, hopefully all the state, yeah. Okay, everybody in this room is caught up. So Act 250 means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, but the basic premise is to, uh, that we did when we updated the bill was to focus on smart growth so that we eliminated sprawl and that we had growth in our development are developed downtowns that have wastewater and sewer, um, that our, our, our natural forest blocks aren't being disconnected or, uh, I mean like lots of different goals smushed into a basic concept of smart growth. So we targeted exemptions and incentives over time into our high density areas to have those be the places where we have more housing built. So for my area, that's like White River Junction. White River Junction has exemptions now where we can build a ton of housing densely in our downtown. That's great for all those transportation concerns. That's like a big part of it. Um, but it also um, supports, I think, like the development we kind of all want to see, which is we don't want some random apartment building out in the middle of nowhere, not connected to services, like with 150 people. Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, but a cheap flat cornfield might be the best development cost analysis choice. So it was tr that is kind of the concept around that bill. Uh, it also got rid of a lot of. Uh, bureaucratic related uh, concerns that we heard from developers, uh, but at the same time created a blueprint for a planning process that you will be able to participate in over the next six years through your regional planning commissions. Um, and that will, another tiers, we're doing more tiers. Um, <laughs> there's a, it creates a tiered, uh, um, it creates tiers of what type of uh, standards and requirements there are within those tiers for development. A little complex, but there's going to be places that are tier 1A, which means that they are where we want to see development. It's like a downtown area, and we, they have all the things they need to be able to develop. Then tier 1B is a little bit closer to, they're a big area, they've got the tools in their toolbox, but they're not exactly where we want all of the development. And then tier 2 will be the majority of the state, and tier 3 is where the win for folks who are concerned about natural resources is. Tier 3 is our high priority, most important, valuable natural resources. And we will get to identify those as communities throughout a multi-year process. So start thinking if you, or this is why I tell my people, start thinking about where that beautiful waterfall is and where you don't want a McMansion next to it. So think about those, that's the next six years, and you'll probably be invited to some community meetings to talk about it. Um, Sarita, you raised your hand. Uh, for the town meeting folks, Sarita made a really good point that the development we want to have is where we see wastewater and water. Yes. Exactly. And that was a fierce debate about what that, what that actually meant. Um, so <laughs> different, different strokes, different folks on that one, but excellent point. Uh, so multiple folks, when I was meeting you, you brought up transportation and it also got brought up quite a bit by our state reps and senators. So. I want to spend a little bit of time here, but we got to highlight a Brattleboroite, Brattleboroite, that, I don't know, 
This is Molly Burke. She is the state rep from Brattleboro. Woo, we love her. She is a bike champion. Um, we should also note just down the street is the uh, now deceased representative Kurt McCormick's home. Uh, Kurt was a a legend in the uh, community of public transportation, bike pedestrians, and this guy didn't even own a car. Like, incredible man. And I really do think that. Um, we will have more work to do to build on his legacy, but we can be proud of the work that we did this last session within the T-Bill. Um, the transportation budget bill uh, is a place that we don't, oh! No, remind me tomorrow. <laughs> what if I was like, let's do it now. <laughs> it's like, actually, let's, oh, let's do those updates now. Um, the, <laughs> the transportation budget bill uh, usually comes to us from the administration, and there's not a lot of wiggle room. So all of the exciting things that we hear from our constituents who say, I want more public transportation, I want better sidewalks, I want microtransit, and I want high-speed rail we go you know we go I am so sorry <laughs> they we have no pot of money for this and we actually have a shrinking pot of money for this but we will fight for the things that you want um, and I have to applaud uh, the house transportation members because it is not an easy fight to get even tiny amounts of money to go towards the things that I think you and I agree on, which is climate solutions within our transportation sector. But you can be really proud of their work and how they were especially able to move or like pivot some federal funding in the direction of the priorities that we want. Um, and if you, I don't know if folks want, if you want to add on to that now or after, but um, there is a, a whole conversation we can have about what we need to do next year to make sure that federal funding um, gets used properly. But the last, I believe the last, nope, just kidding. The second to last uh, slide for a bill is just like joy personified, which is Mike Rice when we passed the pollinators bill. Um, if you eat strawberries or blueberries or apples, you also are going to need to have some pollinators um, in your life if you want to continue to have those delicious fruits. And we know that neonicotinoid pesticides uh, can actually harm our pollinators. And I feel like there's no, where is the poster for the pollinator stuff, Vperg? Like, this is like your issue. Where's a big, like, bee? Um, <laughs> it's over in there. Um, well, this was a very big issue for Vperg. Um, and what I appreciated about the conversation was it really was meant to support our farmers moving away from neonicotinoids rather than just straight up pulling the rug out from them. Um, we've tried over time to move them away from it, but for some folks, myself included, feels a little slow towards it, but um, definitely some good compromise. Yeah, that's a big one. And I think uh, Phil Scott, did he veto that one and we overrode that one? Yeah, no, another example of a veto. Um, oh, and this one he didn't, though. Um, this is make big oil pay. So it's, it's going to cost us. He didn't, he, sign he didn't sign it. He didn't want to fully sign it. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. He did, uh, okay, so we overrode that one too. Um, and this bill is very important because unfortunately, not only will we feel the impacts of natural disasters, we're also gonna have to pay for them. Uh, and it costs us a billion dollars just with July 2023 flooding. So you can only expect just how much more taxpayers are gonna have to contribute to responding to this crisis. So. As a legislature, we passed a bill saying that the largest fossil fuel companies who are most culpable uh, for the implications of climate change are the ones who should pay for it. Um, it's a very uh, interesting time to be in the legislature because just a few years ago we heard that we couldn't get big pharma to pay for some of the opioid crisis and, oh wait a minute, isn't that what they're doing now? So I really do feel like we're on the cusp with the same conversation with our oil companies where we're right now being told, no, 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 there's no way they'll ever put any money towards it. Well, that's what the frickin' Sackler family was telling us a few years ago. So, I don't know, maybe we should give us some time, really see what's gonna happen. Okay, and it made national and international news, way to go VPR canvassers, uh, and I hope 
that we get something good out of this. Now it's a little bit of a waiting game. They haven't sued us yet, is my understanding. I looked at Tom, he's like through the door. Like, he's like, my <laughs> they haven't sued us yet. Um, so next up for this legislative session, we're gonna be working on something called the Affordable Heat Standard, or for, sorry, the Affordable Heating Act, also known as the Clean Heat Standard. Kind of like smush those together. Uh, the Affordable Heat Act uh, was a bill that we worked on this last le legislative session that put out a study of the concept of something called a clean heat standard. So last year we didn't actually pass a clean heat standard. Instead, we passed a bill to research and analyze what it would look like if we were to move forward with a clean heat standard and the programs that it would create. So what we need to do next year is take the information and research that we got from the PUC report, the Public Utilities Commission, and um, information from the Public Service Department, and kind of do it all over again to figure out if this is the right strategy for us to lower our carbon emissions in the thermal sector. What the concept of a clean heat standard is, like what are we actually studying, is a credit-based market that fossil fuel companies, mainly depots, that they would be regulated in a market-based system where they were incentivized to support their customers transitioning off of fossil fuel. So what does that mean? That means if you want to get a heat pump or weatherize your home or get a wood pellet heat, you know, heating stove, you will get support from your fossil fuel dealer like Coda and Coda or Irving in my case, because they have goals, uh, sorry, they have requirements that they have to meet and to get credit to help them meet those requirements, they have to then help folks go towards those um, transitional options like those heat pumps like that weatherization uh, it's a new thing it's a creative idea and it is a way to make sure that our small businesses are a part of the transition and also prioritizes our lowest and moderate income vermonters getting access to funds so that they can transition off of fossil fuels because the number one thing I hear from constituents is that they want to be off fossil fuels but they can't afford the upfront cost of doing it. So we need to have a funding source that helps us transition Vermonters away from fossil fuels, knowing that that cost just keeps on going up. If you remember a few slides back, electricity, very stable. But not only is it that it's hiking up and costing us more money and is creating, you know, wars <laughs> um, in other countries, if you don't care about that or the morality of it, it's also something that we have to do legally to meet something called the Global Warming Solutions Act requirements. So even if you don't care morally or you're not worried about the cost or say la vie, you love propane, um, who knows? Um, it's still something we legally have to do, so we need to come up with a plan to actually lower our thermal emissions. and. That's my bit on the Affordable Heat Act. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them. I've been very disappointed by the um, some of the attacks on the Affordable Heat Act as of late. I didn't bring it with me, but I've been carrying it around to my different campaign forums, which is a flyer that um, a group has been handing out of a old, older man shivering wrapped in a blanket with gloves and a hat over his fuel bill um, and that says it is freezing clearly, saying the supermajority of Democrats are to blame for your fuel bill going up. Now, I haven't seen a scare tactic like that in a while. Um, so that means they're not very happy about the bill, and we need to make sure that we have Climate Solutions Caucus members winning elections so that we have the numbers to override the veto that's coming our way if we do anything on this topic. So that means you should consider registering to vote if you care about this issue. Uh, and if you are registered to vote or you want more information about uh, candidates, you can certainly check out VPIRG's resources. You can also check out if you are registered to vote at mvpvermont.gov, which is a great website run by our Secretary of State. And now I'm done talking to you and you'll get to talk to each other. <laughs> which is the best part of the whole thing. Um, it is what time? 6.43. It's 6.43.
we usually go like an hour with these things, but since you know we had some late arrivals, Burlington's like a late night crowd. We could stay till 7:30. <laughs> okay, maybe you're not late night crowd. Okay, who knew? Um, but let's try to wrap at 7:30. So since it's um, so, how about I know Leonora, you want to say something? So let's have if any state reps want to jump in now, and then we'll jump into uh, some individual conversations. Yes. Thank you. No, of course, and thank you, Becca. She's amazing, right? Give her a hand. So I also wanted to share, um, so one of the things that we failed to do in the Transportation Committee <laughs> uh, was a cap and invest program that failed two years ago, which was tragic because 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions are because of transportation, right? Um, so, or higher. Yeah, as, as we get more efficient, it kind of goes up and down between transportation and heating, right? And thermal. So, um, so if you want to hear about, we, we did legislate at the end of, in that T-bill, in that um, H861, uh, we called for a report back and a study about um, the feasibility, the costs, and the benefits um, to to re reinitiate that um, that project, and so um, I wanted to share with everybody that another action that you can take uh, right now is if you pull out your phones and you visit climate change dot one word climate change dot vermont dot gov forward slash calendar. You can sign up to register for a link to join a Zoom call in a week, right? October 3rd is a week from now, or two weeks. I don't know where we're at now. It's election season. <laughs> and you can select either a 12 noon or 6 p.m. Uh, session to learn about what the Agency for Natural Resources has come up with for um, that discussion. So I highly encourage you to do that because that is another massive key to solving this. And I think that it will also help us address some of the funding shortfalls that we're always uh, so worried about um, in addressing the, the pollution that is created by our transportation sector. And I'm going to give you, hang on, I'm going to give you the, yeah, why don't you go up front so yeah. people don't crane their necks. Uh, I'll just add to that, you know, we're talking about the, The clean heat standard, which is addressing our thermal heat uh, needs and, and trying to uh, get off fossil fuels for that. And then we have the transportation, maybe a cap and trade. We're looking at New York State is doing something. We could join with them, some of the western states. So that's what this study is looking at. Um, both of those are, are ways to um, uh, get funds that can then be funneled to people and businesses to transform how they heat or, or their transportation. And it really is modeled after Efficiency Vermont, which has been around for maybe 20 years. Um, if people remember when that first came out, basically it was money from your electric bill that was put toward program Efficiency Vermont. And, and now it's part of our life. I mean, you know, you uh, get a new uh, appliance or um, all, every business has had their lighting changed. Our church had their lighting changed, you know, using those funds. And so that's why some of our electricity I is, is low cost and our, the usage of electricity for a number of years went down. Um, and it didn't go up because of efficiency. So that program is highly successful, um, and that these other programs are an attempt to really uh, model that, to find uh, the ways to allow us to make these more difficult transitions for transportation and thermal. So, of course, Brian. Yeah, love this. So yeah, if you're a transportation person, find these two afterwards. So maybe you two can be our transportation people. We can do it based on issues. 
Yeah. So I'm just going to say something about the, the political dynamic and not the policy for a second. Because we heard how we had a record-breaking number of Climate Caucus members. I think I'm the senior member here. I got elected in 2016. And so I've, and so I've been uh, elected during a Republican president and a Democratic president. But it's been a Republican administration all along with a Republican governor who denied cli climate change stuff to start and has slowly shifted as it can't be denied. But people say he's nice. He's, I say actions speak louder than words. So like, you know, they accused me of being uncivil when I wrote to them recently and said, you clearly favor corporations over people. Like they were offended that I, that's uncivil for me to say, but it was in the face of some of his vetoes where he clearly was like siding with like the corporate data people, you know, um, big oil, et cetera. So I say this because it's not, it's important to elect progressives, Democrats, and any others, even though they're rare, who would be in the climate caucus because that veto proof majority is important if he comes back. But it's also important because as I've seen the climate caucus grow, it's easier for us to move things. And like, we used to have to fight so hard. And, and Mitzi Johnson, the speaker, actually was on our side and had every committee focus on climate change, but it's still hard to get the votes and to get things moving when you don't have that momentum. So that should be the primary reason we keep electing climate champions. But the secondary thing to remember is that you don't have to vote for Phil Scott. And that, you know, if, even if the Democrat doesn't have the political experience, she has administrative experience, and if she wins, she can assemble a team of experts to help her govern very quickly. So I just want to encourage people to vote for the Democrat, because if we, if, if we had a Democrat as governor, it would be a lot easier. We would, it wouldn't be about building this number to override him. It would be about build, working together with the state agencies and the legislature to do what's best. So I just want to encourage people um, What's that? Esther Charleston is her name, and I don't even know her yet. Like, I haven't had a chance to meet her yet, but what I know about her is good, and honestly, it's, we're at a point where, like, we need someone other than Phil Scott because the obstruction is inefficient, it's slowing us down, and we can't slow down at this point. Like, w it, this is an emergency that we're in on every level, so I'll stop there. But I just wanted to share that perspective because we, should, we shouldn't need a veto-proof majority. We should be working as a partner with the governor, whoever it is, and it's not like that. Thanks. Thanks for hearing me out. Yeah. Yay, vote Esther. Um, um, I wanted to follow up on um, what we're going to be doing next, um, next session. Obviously, the Clean Heat Standard Affordable Heat Act is um, going to take a lot of work. Um, it's, it's a big policy. But another thing that we did um, in the Renewable Energy Standard Bill was a study um, because one of the compromises um, that landed us in a position where we could get a bill passed was um, to consider eliminating virtual net metering. I don't know if you all are energy nerds. Um, you'd pretty much have to be to know what virtual net metering is, but essentially it's the idea that you get paid for energy you produce from a solar array, virtual net metering, um, allows you to build a solar array at a distance from where your land is physically located, but consider it your solar array and get paid for the energy that's created by that solar array. Um, so that's uh, one of the things that we kind of had to give up. Um, <laughs> and, that, and it really benefits renters? Well, so it's not often utilized. It hasn't been often utilized. That was one of the arguments for getting rid of it. But that's largely because it would be primarily beneficial for multifamily housing, for example. Like, I live right over here around the corner at the Bright Street Housing Cooperative. Uh, we live in the footprint of what is uh, a rather large house in Shelburne, but we house 80 people on that site. We don't have enough property to put a solar array that would power 40 households. Um, there's a parking lot right over here that could use solar panels to cover it, um, and that could power our community. But if we eliminate virtual net metering, then we can't use that power for our community and reduce our electricity <laughs> bills. I will say, the people who live in my housing cooperative, it's not a, it's not an ownership co-op, it's a 
um, no equity co-op. So we've got people who have just transitioned out of homelessness all the way up to market rate units, but the vast majority of the people who live at the Bright Street Housing Co-op are low and moderate income households. Now, um, we're finally getting money from the federal government, um, from the Inflation Reduction Act. A large portion of it is supposed to benefit low and moderate income households. So this is the moment, this is our moment, right? We can finally use public resources to help install solar arrays for people who can't afford to do it themselves. Um, however, <laughs> then we're gonna eliminate the one tool that would allow folks to have like zero dollar electricity bills um, for decades. So I had a serious problem with that issue, like a real problem with it. So we put a study in the bill um, to say like, okay, if we're gonna get rid of virtual net metering, then what are options that will make it possible for low and moderate income households, especially multifamily households, to benefit from solar installations? Um, and have their electricity bills uh, reduced. I have to say, I spoke with a lot of utility folks during that whole debacle controversy <laughs> there, um, and I did want the bill to get passed, um, but the ideas that they were sharing weren't, weren't satisfying to me. People with more resources who've been able to install solar panels on their own properties have gone a decade without paying an electricity bill. And now that we have the resources to help low and moderate income households put solar panels adjacent, or not, not adjacent, <laughs> not adjacent, a couple blocks away <laughs> from their, <laughs> at least one parcel away <laughs> from the parcel <laughs> next to them. <laughs> um, uh, now that we have the resources to help folks who don't have much money um, get solar panels to benefit um, them. They, they, can't, they can't take the initiative to do these projects and, and reduce their bills. I'll give an example from the building. Um, let's say we did put a solar array here in the parking lot and used virtual net metering, sold our electricity produced back into the grid. Um, one thing that we'd be able to do is reduce the number of um, meters in our building to one. We could just do a central meter, no electricity bills for anybody in the building. It would also allow us to install um, cold weather heat pumps in a way that would be, you know, like we'd all get air conditioning as well. We've got people who are physically, like have a disability. It's getting hotter in the summer. It's very expensive to, um, you know, cool your apartment. So there are so many benefits to this. This is one of those things where I, I, I will be pushing really hard next session to make sure that we're delivering the absolute most economic benefit to low and moderate income households as we make this energy transition. Thank you for letting me get on my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, you literally, you guys have the best reps, like no joke. And great senators too. I don't know, Tanya, if you wanted to say anything or we can. Yes, let's do it. Okay, we're going to break it out. Um, Leonor and Phil, do you guys mind having, if you wanted to talk transportation, maybe find you guys. And then otherwise, um, are there any issues you, you, if someone wants to talk renewable energy standard and next steps, I think, Kate, this is probably the big one for you. Um, Brian, it sounded like you really wanted to talk to people about like intersectionality and housing. Yeah, I would say um, housing, public health, equity. Yes. Yes. You can head over to Brian. And then, uh, cool, yeah. If you want to do renewable energy standard or um, thermal energy, yeah. So, okay, let's split up. Phil and Leonora over here. Kate Logan over there. Brian in the back. Take your chairs with you. You're right here. And we'll do this for about 15, 10 to 15 minutes. 
would then say uh, Sunday, Sunday, a high priority on yeah. my side. Yeah. 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 And a lot of people. So we because one, this is the one thing that really you know, the that one. Yeah, THCD and it was administered by Green Mountain. Yeah, and they've been doing it for a while. Yeah. And, um, and it's really just starting to, they, you know, I think when we saw up there, they testified, they said, you know, they spent six or eight million dollars. And they just started to put the charge. Yeah. They're just starting to put the charge. Yeah. So we uh, put in uh, more money. I think so. I think we put. A, I think we put some more money in, and we may have also extended. Did we? Did we say that if it didn't get used so up? If we, we did put more money in because we, we saw that as a, yeah. a real hole in our um, desire to. Um, yeah. Transform to electrified vehicles, yeah. and that you know, again, I have my own house. I got my own charger in there. No, no big deal. But if you're in a condo. On yeah, it's tantamount. Building. If we don't have yeah. them on site, it's tantamount no to saying it's tantamount yeah. to saying yeah. that EV is not an option. Right. We totally right. agree with you. We saw this program was really successful. Yeah, it is. And that I mean, we're they, ready to go. Got a if the grant in, came in, I think, boom, we're so on. So I, I expect there'll be a big push okay. by the yeah. Democrats in, the, in our transportation committee yeah, yeah. And, and our caucus to okay. push this program. And so we'll get updates on where they are. I do also believe, because um, I was just talking to some of the folks at AOT, um, that they uh, another, they're putting in a federal grant to, okay. to try to get some funds specifically for this. For that. So um, I'm okay. glad you brought it up because it, it is. Yeah. I think it's perfect. Yeah. We, I put out a, we put a newsletter out, and there were like eight of our, well, we'll say 10% of our residents said they would buy an EV right away yeah. if we yeah. had an on-site charger. Yeah. 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 So we are seeing great steps in the right direction, but I think we can go further in the design. And so I'm doing a lot of research on this, and so you may be able to help, but others may have expertise to help about what those exact things are and how we can start testing them out. But when I, so that just to launch us off, that's really what I'm saying is at this moment in history, we, we're already looking at land use, we're trying to adapt to climate change and to floods and landslides and all these things. We're trying to solve a housing crisis that is worsening the divide, and 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 it, housing is been treated as a commodity, not as a basic need of life. So we have an opportunity here. If we change, if we bring unhoused people and those who've been disenfranchised into the process, which I'm on the land access and opportunity board, and we can talk about that those more later if you want. But our job is to look at how to provide land access and opportunity to the people who've been most disenfranchised. And we're currently shifting towards looking at homelessness and taking some action around that. But if we could bring them in and then the neighbors together and say, we're all neighbors, housed and unhoused in this area. We're business owners, we're, you know, some people born here, some people came here, but like, what, what's working and what do we dream of it to be? If we do that process right, we can heal the social fabric and then build infrastructure that not only is resilient, but solves many problems in the very infrastructure around environmental impact. So that's sort of my little spiel on it. And so maybe if people want to speak, I'm not going to try to control the conversation, you know, but people want to weigh in on that or share thoughts or ideas. I love the idea of incorporating the social um, aspect, but it may be different for a rural person. It will. Like I, yeah. I grew up rural. I live in Bronson, so I have a concept of what you're talking about. But I grew up rural, and there you just have to have, you have, to have your community center. You have to have your, you know, center. You have to have your center. Okay. Since you all still really want to talk, we're gonna end. Yes. Since we're not gonna do, you all still want to talk, so we're just gonna go straight to 7:30. So stick around. It officially ends at 7.30, but keep talking if you want.
There we go. Thank you, everyone, for coming. If you leave right after this, yay. Yes.